envisage partners with experts like Julian Gray to help seniors in planning for their future. Envisage is a long-term planning solution for adults age 60 and above that lets you anticipate your future care needs and plan for them now. Envisage is more than a financial plan. It is a plan that includes a focus on health and wellness, as well as care coordination, should you need it in the future. Did you know that 70% of people over the age of 65 will need some type of long-term care? And even if you are covered financially, do you have a plan in place for who will take care of you should an unexpected health event occur? If you envision a future of living independently in the home you love without being a burden to friends and family, Envisage may be right for you. To learn more, visit envisage.org or call us at 866-599-0925. Today, we are fortunate to have Julian Gray, certified elder law attorney and founder of Julian Gray Associates with us to discuss things you should be looking out for when it comes to estate planning. His expertise in this field will help you evaluate if your estate plan is where it needs to be to ensure that you are prepared for the future. Julian provides advice and legal services for elder law estate tax planning, special needs planning, and settlement planning. His company has been helping people for over 25 years in Medicaid planning, veterans benefits, and related estate planning and tax issues. Julian Gray Associates is the only firm in the United States with nine CELA attorneys. CELA is the certification by the National Elder Law Foundation and is the only certification in the field of elder law approved by the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Now that you know a little bit about Julian and his firm, I'm going to turn over this discussion to him where he will be presenting on the seven signs that you need an estate planning checkup. Thanks, Joan, and thanks to Envisage to having uh, inviting me here today. It's certainly my pleasure to be able to bring this information to everyone. My hope is that you can take away some information that will help you or a family member or a loved one or someone that, that you know, um, because these seven signs that you need an estate planning checkup may not always be readily apparent as we go about our busy lives. So our hope for you today is to be able to identify with any of these things and then get more information um, and, and find out if you need to do something about your estate plan. So we'll spend um, some time here talking about these seven signs you may need an estate planning checkup, and then we'll take questions uh, from our listeners and, and we'll go from there. Um, to just kind of give you a little background um, before we get started with the substantive information, um, there's some information on the slide about our law firm and uh, we handle cases all over Pennsylvania. Um, our, our expertise in this area, as Joan indicated, um, is that we're all certified elder law attorneys. And that really means that we are focusing on uh, the needs of people uh, as they age, people with disabilities of any age. I frequently tell clients uh, that my youngest uh, client is now two years old, my oldest client is 101, and, and everywhere in between. So. The types of things that we need to focus on can happen at any age. It's not just when we retire, although we will talk about that in, in one of our slides here about what's the age where we start thinking about these things. And so it's important to understand that as we get older, we do need more care and uh, costs get expensive and care coordination gets uh, tough to do sometimes. So we're, we're all looking towards the future. Um, just the last piece about what we do, um, many of you listening to this and, and many people generally speaking, think of lawyers and think about aging and the process and immediately think about needing a will. And um, so if you look at the first few bullet points there, um, that kind of addresses the limited scope of that thought process of just needing a will, 
Wills are very common and they're needed in almost everyone's case. But just take a look at all the different bullet points here of all the things we're looking at and we're paying attention to as we age. And, and so, you know, Envisage in that same vein is doing that kind of thing. You know, we're not just looking at one piece, we're looking at this journey that we're on, um, whether it's living in your home, long-term care, whatnot, um, financing these things, which we'll talk about uh, today as well. Uh, this is a real journey and, and we all know people are living longer. So we need to be prepared um, to, to go on this journey uh, after retirement. So with that, where does this journey begin? Number one, you're over 70 and you haven't investigated options to obtain and pay for long-term care before a crisis. Uh, frequently in our office, we always tell clients there are two types of cases in this area. There's the crisis and there's the pre-plan. And you can guess which one is better to endure. And so we really wanna make sure people understand that, you know, People are living longer, and even if you retire in your 60s and start taking Social Security, and you opt into Medicare at age 65, um, and then you, you know you're working even sometimes, um, you're going to probably live a lot longer than your ancestors did. And so we need to understand that you know it gets more expensive as we get older. Uh, I, you know I've handled thousands of clients over the pa past two decades, and um, it's really rare. Uh, to see someone as they age use less doctors, less medications, and less care. And so we already know where this is going because just generally speaking, as our bodies age, we're going to need a little more help. So um, we don't want to have a crisis and not be prepared because what does that look like? Well, that means someone had a fall or someone had a stroke or someone had some type of medical event that's going to land them probably in a hospital, at least for some period of time. And this can be the slippery slope, right? If we haven't talked about long-term care, if we haven't talked about how we're going to pay for that, and also how to get quality care, regardless of the setting, then we're really in for a surprise. And, you know, one of the things we do at our law firm, we have two social workers on staff. And so they're frequently going out to visit clients and families and hospitals and nursing homes and other types of facilities, maybe even in their homes. And, and you know, people are really focused on the medical care, as we should be, right? Someone has a medical event, um, let's get better. That's number one. Uh, we'll worry about how to pay for it later. But there are a lot of questions there and families have a lot of questions. So why not know the answers so that when that medical event occurs, you can say, oh, well, mom is enrolled in traditional Medicare. So this is how this is going to work. Or mom is in a Medicare Advantage plan. So this is how this is going to work. And so just understanding all these things. And then the final analysis, you really have to separate the acute care from the long term care. So the acute care is typically going to be your health insurance type things, and, and most people are covered under that as they age. But advancing to the next slide, you'll see what happens when this pivots to long-term care. And so what I've listed up on the slide are basically the five most common areas where people will search to try to subsidize their long-term care costs. And in many of these cases, it's a combination of paying privately out of your savings or you know getting into a private long-term care insurance policy or some equivalent of that um, medicare or medicaid two very different programs medicaid is a public welfare program that is a federal program administered in pennsylvania medicare is a federal health insurance program that's administered here in pennsylvania so Two very different programs, some areas where Medicare covers things, some areas where Medicaid covers things. One of the biggest surprises people have when they have some type of a medical event as they age is that Medicare is really only meant to pay for the hospital doctor's visits and, and short-term uh, therapeutic assistance. And so you get into this long-term care arena and you start understanding the limitations of traditional Medicare or if you have a Medicare Advantage plan. So you really want to know what's it going to cover. And also, you know, if you're getting into Medicare, if you're just enrolling in Medicare at age 65, there's some things you need to know about what your options are. And so you want to make sure you know all your options. Um, second to the last thing, veterans benefits. 
you know, Pennsylvania, one of the top five states in the United States for veterans and one of the top five states for veterans over the age of 65. In fact, there are over 750,000 wartime veterans in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania right now. And considering that many of the veterans benefits programs also apply to widows of veterans who typically will live for a significant time period longer than the actual veteran, you can imagine the size of this cohort. And so right now in 2020, we're seeing the bubble of the Vietnam War veterans age and, and those are the folks that are really going to need help and their widows will need help as well. So we wanna be aware of that bucket of money that's available. And then finally, social security. As we all know, it's an election year. And so everyone's talking about public programs like social security and these things tend to change from year to year, but understand how your social security works. Understand how it works for your spouse. Understand how it works if your spouse dies first or you die first or if you have a disabled adult child in your family. These are all relevant things that people need to know and shouldn't find out as they're being discharged from the emergency room. So that's a good primer on all these different ways to pay for care. And many people can utilize uh, more, the majority of these, of these uh, options. So that's number one. What about number two? Your estate planning documents are over 10 years old. Uh, this is pretty common, right? People come into the office and say, oh, I did this old will when the kids were young or, you know, whatever. And um, I probably, it's probably no good anymore. And the answer is not necessarily, uh, but the answer really depends on most of the tax laws many times. The tax laws are what change. It's not so much that the rules regarding wills or trusts change so much. It's typically the tax laws that change and that causes people to change their focus on, on their estate planning documents and how they're drafted. So number two, if your estate planning documents are more than a decade old, or you've had a significant change in your life, um, kids, grandkids, marriage, divorce, whatever, move to another jurisdiction, this is really a time to get a checkup. And while you're doing that, you wanna pay attention to what's happened across the country, is that we've had a real paradigm shift in the technical term, estate planning. Well, I guess it's kind of generic, but look at the first bullet point. Everyone used to focus on death and taxes, right? Well, that's changed. A lot of that has changed. Many attorneys who are not specialists in elder law and don't really understand the long-term care continuum are still asking what I believe to be the wrong question, which is what happens when you die? And I ask the question, what happens if you live? And what happens if you live a really long time and it's really expensive and you need a lot of help? And that's really where the new focus is. So if you look at the second bullet point, here's where our focus is on long-term care costs, asset protection, multiple marriages, which we'll talk a little bit about when we talk about trusts, and children protection. And finally, the pensionless generation, right? Unless you work for the government right now, or you're a teacher or an educator, um, you probably are not getting some type of a guaranteed pension plan. And so there's a whole nother generation out there that is um, going to rely upon their 401k for their lifetime retirement savings. And so they need to understand how that works. And parents need to understand um, when they have IRAs, how that's going to affect their children. And last but not least, remember, when Medicare and Medicaid were invented over a half century ago, people got their benefits around 65 and they died around 65 and a half. And so now people live another 25 or 30 years. And so you have to plan because it's expensive to live another 25 or 30 years when you're not working. So these are things that we've seen shift over the last 10 or 20 years when people come into the office. And so, the, the takeaway for all of you is not so much what I have here on the next slide, that wills were the standard document. Wills are still pretty rudimentary documents that are needed in every estate plan, but they typically no longer, at least in the plans that I've been doing, don't form the cornerstone of, of the documentation. It's more now about trusts. And, and the reason why people use trusts are, are varied. And, and many of them could be things like second marriages, um, keeping funds in the bloodline, so to speak. And we'll talk a little bit about these things, but really um, 
the thing to know about trust is that they're very, very commonplace. There are many, many types of trust. I get lots of people that say, do I have to be rich to have a trust? And the answer is, well, what do you mean by rich? Um, the answer is really, no, what are your circumstances and what are you trying to accomplish? And then sometimes a trust document or a series of trust documents can be the answer uh, to help you um, accomplish your estate planning goals now and, and beyond your lifetime. So look at the assets, look at this, this switch as well. Think about that. We used to have clients come in 10, 20 years ago and they had CDs, stock certificates, and savings bonds, right? We all remember this. And for those of us who had parents in that situation, they remember having that too. But that's really not what we're seeing anymore, especially with interest rates being as low as they are and people being concerned about stock market volatility. What we're seeing now are more people that have 401ks, uh, 457s, 403s, all of which eventually turn into IRAs. And this is really where we're at in our country now. Um, most of my clients' net worth, when I see them come into the office, is when you take their house, their other assets and whatnot, um, their IRAs are typically the most valuable asset. Here's a little secret. IRAs never control your are never controlled by your last will and testament. So if you walk into an estate planning attorney's office, and I just said that people's most valuable asset right now is their 401k or their IRA, and your will does not affect that, and there's a real good tax reason why it doesn't. Why are we so focused on doing new wills when wills don't really handle our IRAs anymore? So when you get into that thought process, you start saying, well, wow, what does handle my IRA then when I die or if I become disabled? How does that work? And we'll talk about that. So moving on to number three, your IRAs only name and your spouse and your children as beneficiaries. Look, everyone who works now pretty much has an IRA or a 401k. And so um, you're going to have to name somebody as the beneficiary on that qualified money if you died. You just have to. They probably won't let you out of the HR manager's office until you put somebody's name down as a beneficiary. And so most people, if they're married, they name their spouse because that's easy and it's tax-free and it just makes sense. And then they name their children as the beneficiaries. But as I said before, there's been a real paradigm shift. And so, you know, things are different now. Things aren't the way they were 10 and 20 years ago. So let's take a look at what's changed and what people are doing with their IRAs. New historical levels of wealth. Last number I saw was $26 trillion of IRA money in the United States right now. $26 trillion suspended in IRAs across the United States. That does not include probably another 100 trillion or so outside the United States. But just imagine how much money is out there, right? All these pension plans that we used to have for people who are now in their you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s, those all went away. And remember, pensions go away when people die. It's just a payment stream every month, but there's no lump sum afterwards typically. It just goes away when the, when the parent dies or the second parent dies. But with these IRAs, people were using the money for their lifetime, and then they've got to figure out what to do with the rest because it doesn't go away. And so what we find is that, and it's nobody's fault, but 90% of everyone with an IRA names their spouse and their kids as their beneficiary. But look at the third bullet point. There's no protection from what I call DDDBB, which is disability, death, divorce, bankruptcy, and just bad decisions. And I'm talking about the people you're leaving your IRA to. And so when you leave your IRA outright to your spouse and then your spouse gets remarried, well, your IRA is now going to their next spouse or to their kids from their prior marriage. People don't think about these things all the time, but they happen more and more now because the volume of IRAs in this country has incredibly increased in the last 20 years. And the number of second and third marriages has increased incredibly in the last 20 years. And so you have to kind of, figure out where your IRA is going to go. And it's just a different type of planning because you have to name a beneficiary. And once you do, it's got to go there and it's you really only get one bite at the apple, okay? The key to understand is all the things we're talking about as far as an IRA checkup have nothing to do with how you spend your IRA while you're alive. You never have to change your investment advisor. You never have to do anything other than live off your IRA and enjoy it. And if you spend it and you die with no IRA, you probably had a pretty good time. So if there's anything left though, 
What do you want to do with it? And that's the next slide. You can now designate a family trust as the beneficiary of your IRA. And so for many of our clients, they'll come in and say, look, um, if I have two or three kids or whatever, and then I've got some grandkids, I want my IRA to go down the bloodline. But if one of my kids dies prematurely or something happens, I want that IRA to stay in trust for my grandkids or my great grandkids. And God forbid all of them are gone. I want it to go back up, up the bloodline and down the other side to my other children. And that's what a trust can do for you that simply naming a beneficiary of your IRA cannot do. And some of these IRAs are pretty significant. We'll have some clients come in with three, four, five million dollar IRAs. I realize that's the exception and not the norm for most people. But even if it's a few hundred thousand dollars, it's so easy to avoid that risk of that IRA going somewhere later uh, that you didn't want it to. And the bottom line is that you've got to do it while you're alive. And the beneficiary designations are key. You could draft the best, most beautiful 300 page trust document, which I would never draft something that long, but lawyers do draft long documents. But you could have this really great voluminous document that covers all these issues. But if you don't what we call point your IRA beneficiary designation to that trust document, none of those protections ever happen. So the key on the IRA is taxation. So that brings us to something new that just happened in the last month and a half. The SECURE Act of 2020, if you haven't heard about this, you really need to learn about it. So for everyone in the United States who owns an IRA, who dies after January 1st, 2020, the heirs or the beneficiaries of that IRA must pay all the income tax within 10 years plus the year in which the person died. So it could be up to almost 11 years. So what does that mean? Under the old rules prior to just January 1st of 2020, if you had, a, had an IRA and you left it to your kids, they would have to start paying tax on that immediately at their marginal tax rates. So it's kind of like a ticking time bomb for your, for your adult children. And so you need to be aware of that, whereas if you had a child who, whose parent died and the child was 55 years old at the time their parent died, they could drag that out for another 30 years and pay the tax on, the, on that. Now they have to pay it all in, in 10 years. So when you look at the numbers, it's staggering as to how much income tax is being thrust upon uh, the beneficiaries of these IRAs. And it's going to happen all over the country. So the good news is there's already planning options. Um, there's lots of ways to address this. And it's important that you talk to your lawyer and talk to your financial planner and make sure the lawyer you talk to actually understands IRAs and understands how those IRAs can be stretched and, and taxes can be minimized. But this is something that everyone should really know about because pretty much everyone's going to have an IRA. So the SECURE Act, like I said, just came into being January 1st of 2020. Very new. Lots of, lots of commentary around the Internet on it and from experts. Um, and you just need to be aware um, uh, that this is out there and it affects you. Okay, so shifting gears. Another thing that you might want to think about if you are you know, needing to update your estate plan very common people say, I'm going to give my house to my kids. And that's something that having done this for many years typically scares me. And, uh, and it's because people don't think much beyond the fact they just want to get the title to their home and to their kid's name. And maybe it's because they fear losing their home to a nursing home spend down or state recovery or something like that. Whatever the case is, maybe they want it to be private. Um, you know, They just want to get it to their kids. But there's some real issues with that. And so I just want to alert you to the fact that if you're thinking about giving your home to your kids, typically for a dollar, is what famously everyone says, um, you've got some real tax and control issues. Remember, you give your house to your kids for a buck, your kids now own that house. That means that house is subject to all of the kids' problems. So you give your house to your kids, even if you're still living in it, and your kids divorce. divorced, guess what? you're now having your house sent through equitable distribution for your kid's divorce. Um, the kids get the care parents' cost basis, meaning if you paid $50,000 for your house 40 years ago and it's worth $200,000 now, if you give your house to your kids and then they sell it, let's say a couple years later after you're gone or something or move out, they have to pay capital gains tax on the difference between what you paid for it, which could have been 30, 40 years ago, and what they sell it for now. 
So there's an IRC internal revenue code, which I don't want to get too complex with taxation stuff, but most people know on your primary residence, if you're single, the first $250,000 of gain is, is not taxed. If you're married, it's the first 500,000. It's pretty rare in most areas that people make that much gain on their homes. So typically no one pays capital gains on their homes unless they live in an extremely affluent city where housing prices continue to skyrocket. One of the things we do for parents that want to transfer their homes to their kids is we do what's called an asset protection trust. So actually you transfer your home to a trust where the parents act as their own trustees for their lifetime. They live in the house, they control the home, they can sell it if they want, even if they don't want to give it to their kids and they change their mind. But what's nice is they still don't pay any capital gains tax when they sell it. And it's also not being recaptured if they go into a nursing home and there's Medicaid estate recovery and it, it avoids probate. So there's lots of bonuses here to get that house to the kids. Um, you don't have to just sign your house over for a buck and hope that everything goes well and that your kids never get into trouble. So while we're on the theme of talking about homes and estate planning, because most people have homes, um, number five, you own a second home. If you're fortunate enough uh, to have a second home or a vacation home, if it's outside of Pennsylvania, and if you're listening to this from, from some other state and your vacation home is outside that state, understand what happens if you own that home in that state. When you die, you go through probate twice. As if it's not fun enough to do it once, you get to do it twice. And you get to hire two lawyers instead of one and pay twice the legal fees because you've got to pay your lawyer here in Pennsylvania, let's say. And then let's say you've got a house in Myrtle Beach. You're now going to pay the, the, uh, the Carolina lawyer to take care of this and that. So um, let's avoid that. And many people will, will do a trust or something to avoid that situation and saves them thousands of dollars in legal fees. And then there's also the family disagreements. You know, parents put together vacation homes, but it's extremely rare that every child and every child's child and every in-law and outlaw is going to have the same financial status, the same ability to contribute to the occupancy, use, and enjoyment, so to speak, of a vacation home. Um, things happen. I've seen it happen so many times. And parents really want their kids to have that enjoyment of the family vacation home. It's probably something that's been in their family for decades. And it's totally an emotional thing, and, and I get it. But it's really smart to lay things out because if you don't have it in writing, um, you really could have a problem later on. We see family disagreements about who's kicking in for what and how those things are defined. And then I talk about the outlaw factor. So you have the in-laws and then you have the outlaws. And so when you leave your vacation home uh, without a trust to your four kids and one of those kids gets divorced, well, now your other three kids are dealing with the outlaw. And we don't know what that's going to cost and how long it's going to take and how stressful it's going to be. So when you have vacation homes and they're out of state, especially one of the things we recommend is that people put together some type of a trust agreement to avoid the double probate and also to set out the terms and conditions um, for handling the property after the parents are gone. So moving on to number six, all the things we've talked about are really important. People will ask me all the time, what's the most important document you can ever sign in an estate plan? And this is it. Your power of attorney is the absolute most powerful legal document, more powerful than a trust, a will, a living will, anything like that. And here's why. You are basically saying, I am appointing a surrogate decision maker to control pretty much everything I own. That's really powerful stuff. And so, first of all, you want to make sure you pick the right person or persons. And second of all, you want to make sure it complies with Pennsylvania law. So Pennsylvania law has changed significantly several times in the last 20 years or so. In 1999, there was a very specific change in Pennsylvania. And then again in 2015. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that your power of attorney, and remember we talked about this at the beginning of the program, is that just because my documents are old doesn't mean they're not valid. Uh, to the contrary, sometimes an old power of attorney can be a good thing. But the point is that um, Pennsylvania adopted some very specific powers when it revised the power of attorney statute five years ago. And so if your power of attorney is older, you should probably have it looked at. If it's pre-2015 um, or if it's even post-2015, you should really find out whether or not 
um, this thing is going to comply with Pennsylvania law. And it's an easy fix, it really is. So especially the problem is if you get an online power of attorney, which of course as an attorney, I don't ever recommend that, but people do it. Um, some of those things are not state specific. And Pennsylvania has made some very specific changes to their power of attorney statute. And the last bullet point there before we move on is just, you know, this can make or break the planning options. When you have a medical crisis and you need to change the title to a house or, or withdraw funds from an IRA to pay for care or do something, you want to make sure that power of attorney is going to work because the alternative is going to court and having a guardian appointed. And that's a whole other seminar and we don't even want to talk about that. So to wrap things up, number seven, and this is once again, more of a feel good topic of look, I just want to make sure my grandkids get something. You know, we get people in the office all the time that say, I want to leave everything to my kids, but I really want to leave things to my grandkids. Remember, they love the kids. They love the grandkids even more. So we want to make sure the grandkids get something. And they say, you know, even if the kids are stable, but even if they're not stable. And so, you know, not everything turns out perfectly in life. And so we want to make sure we understand that, people will set up things and kind of do it themselves and say, well, I have a joint account with my daughter or I have a CD that I put my granddaughter's name on in trust for or what's called TOD, transfer on death. But you've got to understand that these things still happen. People, have, people become disabled. People die prematurely. People get divorced. Bad things just happen. It's not about the parents. It's about the kids and the grandkids. So you want to try to protect them and typically you use some type of a family trust. And, and this is the way most people do this. Remember, I've seen cases where people say, I've got five CDs and I'm going into a long-term care facility and I'm gonna start liquidating those CDs. And they said, I put one CD with each of my five kids' name on it as a transfer on death. Well, which one of your kids is paying for your long-term care, right? You're gonna start liquidating the first CD Okay, there goes, you know, um, Mary's uh, CD, and then they they spend that, and then the next one, there goes Sally's CD, oh, and then mom dies after the second D CD is liquidated, and Johnny, Jimmy, and Joey each get their three CDs, and Sally and Jane didn't get theirs. Was it Jane? I don't know. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> but either way, then you get two angry sisters and three kind of, you know, guilty brothers that say, wait a minute, we got our CDs from mom because she didn't spend down her CDs on her long-term care. Sorry, she picked yours first. And it gets even more difficult when one of the sons in that scenario is the power of attorney for mom and says, well, let's pick, Aunt, let's pick sister Mary's CD to liquidate first and not my CD. So, you know, when you do a trust, it avoids a lot of these things. And it really is cheaper and more private um, to administer than going through a will. So I always tell people that if we do our jobs and the clients do their jobs, um, nobody ever walks into a courthouse when people die or become disabled. And that's really what people want. Um, I, I had a client in the other day and I asked him what was the most important thing about his estate plan and what he wanted to accomplish. And he said, I just don't want to lose control. And if I lose control, I want to make sure I have someone in place who's going to make good decisions that I would have agreed with. And so, you know, that's why we use trusts, because they're able to do these types of things um, versus traditional estate planning with wills. And so last couple of things here before we get to our question and answer portion. Um, when do you need to see an elder law attorney? Well, look here, you know, we talked about seven things that might cause you to need a checkup for your estate plan, but certainly approaching retirement, as I said earlier, when you're turning 65 and getting into Medicare, I, I had a lawyer once tell me he strapped a, um, a trash can to his mailbox because he received so many solicitations for Medicare Advantage plans and all these things, he, his mailbox was just full every day. And so clearly, you know, as you approach retirement, you're thinking about how am I gonna enroll in Medicare? Medicare Advantage plan, Medigap plans, all these things, you know, Social Security, should I take full retirement age, should I wait, all these things, um, onset or diagnosis of a disability, well, clearly the writing is on the wall there, and if you have a disabled family member, someone who's already in, in, kind of in that space where they need extra help, um, certainly you need to talk to someone. Um, people who are injured, maybe people who everything from a car accident to a medical malpractice case to a catastrophic construction site injury, whatever it is, those people really need special planning. And most of all, crisis situation. You know, we talked about at the very first bullet point, talking about 
planning for long-term care and avoiding all the stress of the crisis situation, both medical decision and financial decision. And so, you know, we want to get to people as quickly as possible in a crisis situation. And it's funny because when people are in a hospital and they're looking towards rehab, the last thing they're thinking about is lawyers, okay, unless someone's harmed them. And so, um, but you really do need to shift that thinking and say, well, who's going to help me here and who's going to take care of me? And how do I get, you know, my, my uh, needs addressed? So the last thing, the three takeaways I always like to give to people anytime we do a program like this is review your current estate plan. And if you don't have one, that's kind of a glaring signal you need to get one. Um, but does this include a strategy for living independently? We talked about living a long time and most importantly, living in control during your retirement, or is it just some documents? There's a whole nother analysis there that goes beyond just drafting a will or a power of attorney. Secondly, has your health changed in the past few years? And if so, have you addressed it? Um, you know, as I said earlier, our care needs get more expensive as we get older. We usually need more doctors and more specialists as we get older, and it just happens. And we know it's gonna happen, so we might as well face it before it's a crisis. And last, but certainly most important, check your beneficiary designations on your IRAs, and especially on life insurance policies. If you're married and you're now widowed, and you haven't gone back and looked at your life insurance policies, you'd be shocked sometimes to find out there's an absence of a beneficiary designation. And that could cause you to go through probate just for a very small uh, life insurance policy. So more information about this is available on my podcast. If you want to check that out, that's on the iHeartMedia app, and it's also on the um, the iTunes uh, iPod app. So we put stuff like this out all the time. So if this is interesting and you want to learn more, please feel free to check out our podcast. It's free. Uh, you can download it. And we typically try to put stuff out every week or every other week. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. And I hope that I stayed on time as far as uh, everyone's schedule here. And uh, I think, Joan, we're going to do some questions and, uh, and go from there, right? Yes, we okay. are. Oh, fantastic. Here, I'll move this over for you. Just a reminder, if you have a question that you'd like to have addressed, click the chat drop down in your webinar dialog box and type your question into that chat box. So our first question, Julian, is when you discuss the IRA rules, does the same principle apply to my 401k accounts? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is yes. Think about an IRA as the butterfly and the 401k is the caterpillar <laughs> and 403s and 457s they're all caterpillars one day they will turn into the butterfly that is called an ira and the the determining factor is that you haven't paid income tax on any of those earnings and that's why it's typically an ira okay next question am i understanding that a family trust can essentially replace a will or do i need both it's another great question, and many people confuse the two between a will and a trust, and why do you need one or both? The answer is, if you do a family trust and you do it correctly and it's properly funded, you will never need to use your will. But as good practices, we always still have a, a client sign a simple will that just says, hey, if I forgot to put everything in my trust before I die, put in whatever's left now. So it's kind of a catch-all. We call it a pour-over will. And it's very important to have, uh, but it's really just a stopgap measure. So you could just have a trust. If you do it right, you won't need a will. Julian, if my mother would be out of money, would I be forced to pay for her long-term care costs? Well, you know, and that's that's a very hot topic right now. Um, it's called Pennsylvania filial responsibility. We have a statute here in Pennsylvania that specifically addresses this. Uh, many states do this, and adult children are required to uh, pay for their parents' long-term care costs in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, I've written about it in my Post-Gazette column several times over the past few years. You can check that out for more information. But the, the heart of the matter is there is that should never happen. With proper planning and getting out in front of these things and getting a plan as you retire to pay for your care, um, you, you shouldn't ever have to deal with that. If I have a reverse mortgage, can my house be taken away? if I need long-term care services and don't have the resources to pay for them? Well, there's a lot of issues with reverse mortgages. And as good as Tom Selleck is in selling them on television, and he's very believable and everyone trusts him, the answer is it's still a reverse mortgage. It's a debt against your 
property, right? And you've got to be able to understand that it's just like any other mortgage. It doesn't mean you're going to lose your home and um, it doesn't mean it's going to um, uh, cause you to not be able to get long-term care services and whatnot. But remember, it's just a mortgage. And basically, when you move out of your house, and you sell your house, you have to pay off the mortgage and you get whatever's left. So if you didn't use up all the equity, you get the balance paid to you at the closing. Or if you died, then the house will be sold. And at that closing, just like any other mortgage, you would pay that off and um, you would get the balance to your heirs under your will or your trust. But when it comes to long-term care, remember what, and that's a little bit of a mixed question. In Pennsylvania, if you get Medicaid covered home and community based services or skilled nursing care, there's an estate recovery claim out there that would probably attach to your house. But the state would still have attached to your house whether or not you had a reverse mortgage. So the reverse mortgage is not going to affect your eligibility for Medicaid or, or payback to the state of Pennsylvania. Julian, how do you feel about having multiple powers of attorney with equal decision-making responsibilities? Great question. That means the lawyers are going to make a lot of money. Um, no, just kidding. I, you know, the, the, but it's true. You know, so I try to sit down with clients and they say, well, I want to name all three of my kids as my agent under my power of attorney. And I think that's great as long as there's a mechanism for tiebreakers and decision making, especially if there's a crisis. So one of the ways you can do that is if you really feel the need to name all three kids as co-agents serving, serving uh, at the same time, is to say any of my children can act you know, without the joinder of each other or uh, any of my children can act, but if there's a disagreement, it'll be a majority vote or something like that. But having multiple children act without some type of decision-making tiebreaker is an absolute recipe for litigation. What are some of the new options you reference to deal with the regulations of the SECURE Act? Great question. So think about this. When people died with IRAs before January 1st, 2020, Within about a year, their heirs had to start taking the RMDs out of their IRAs and had to start paying taxes. And so many of these folks were in a position where um, they you know, didn't want to pay taxes. You've got a 55-year-old person inheriting a, a million-dollar IRA, and all of a sudden they've got to start paying more taxes at a very high rate. What the SECURE Act allows them to do is actually pay zero taxes, for example, a month scenario. They could just leave it in the IRA for an entire decade and never touch it and just let it grow tax-free. Uh, some other options are if you're charitably inclined, you can actually now take this IRA and you can push it to what's called a charitable trust. And then that allows you to basically still get money to your kids or your grandkids or whomever, but it allows you to take a lot of the money that you would have given to Uncle Sam and you can give it to your charity. So there's lots of, and we don't have enough time to go into them, but that, that'd that be a great uh, topic for later on. <laughs> we could do a whole SECURE Act topic. Great. You talked about the importance of planning for your long-term care costs. I thought that my Medicare and my supplemental plan would cover all of that. And, and that's a common misconception. You know, Medicare was invented, like I said, over a half century ago to cover things because private insurance just didn't work in the 1960s. And so people couldn't get insurance and so forth. It was cost prohibitive. And so Medicare was invented. And Medicare is basically for that acute care. And remember, that's why you're forced into the Part A, the hospital side of Medicare during your wage earning years is it's so important. But as you can see, the, the total focus of Medicare and Medicare Advantage plans is for acute care and rehab. So it was never intended to be a long-term care um, type of, of benefit. And that's a big surprise for people, you know, when they find out they're, they're being discharged to a skilled nursing facility. And if they're lucky and they had the three overnight uh, stays, they get their Medicare coverage. But then after 20 or 30 days, their, their coverage stops and, and it gets expensive. So clearly, to, you know, no, Medicare is not going to be your answer for long-term care costs. I'm going to answer the next question. Okay. It's how would Envisage help me with my long-term costs that Medicare doesn't cover? Mm -hmm. Envisage provides financial protection to help you cover the long-term care costs, whether you're receiving services in your home or in a community like assisted living mm -hmm. or long-term care and nursing care. So Envisage is a great option to explore for covering those costs not covered by your traditional Medicare. 
Yeah, and absolutely. And I think it's all about getting that plan together, right? Um, I had a client in the other day was was concerned about nursing home care. And I said, well, why don't we just make the conversation about how do I just stay at home and, and avoid the nursing home? Because we can do that, you know, in many cases. And so, uh, you know, envisage and, and that type of scenario where you're planning ahead and you're addressing it and starting to get help in your home. Um, yeah, and we know the statistics is that people who address this earlier are less likely to need that heavy skilled nursing care as they age, you know, because they're getting just better care as they age. Exactly. And having a plan in place yeah. helps you avoid the crisis. Our, our favorite cases are the ones where our clients don't have to go to nursing homes. Exactly. <laughs> Mine too. And our final question, how much does it cost to put um, an estate plan in place? That's always the question. And so that, you know, I, I, I can never give prices over the air or wherever because we don't know someone's situation. But the great thing is, is that our law firm is built on um, investigating uh, prospective clients' situations, finding out what their goals are, and then coming up with a, you know, with a, a cost uh, fee, a fixed fee for them to do that type of planning. So they really have nothing to lose. And, um, you know, we really want to just be able to sit down and understand what their choices are and then give them a price. And that's why we don't charge for a consultation to talk about their, their plan. Oh, we have some more questions. Oh, good. Julian. All right. Am I correct that a person can have multiple trusts for example, a family trust and other trusts. Could you explain that? Absolutely. Uh, many of our clients have different types of trusts because trusts are not a function of wealth. Trusts are a function of accomplishing a goal, whether that's protecting the beach house or the IRA or the life insurance policy or keeping it from the outlaws. Um, but yes, many people can have many trusts for many different reasons. And another question, does the size of the estate impact the recommendations on acquiring long-term care insurance? So yeah, that's a good question, you know, and I don't sell long-term care insurance. I'm obviously very familiar with that product because I've seen it for the last 20 years and it has really evolved. I think anyone who's seen long-term care insurance 20 years ago knows that's a very different situation than it was. We have very fewer carriers. Um, my, my typical comment to clients is, when you're considering long-term care insurance, considering why you're buying it, and considering if you'll be able to afford the premiums as you age and those premiums increase, and if that's not going to disrupt your financial lifestyle, then it may be a good option for you because long-term care insurance certainly is very helpful uh, since, as we talked about, Medicare just doesn't cover this stuff. And one more question. Mm -hmm. I am considering moving into a continuum of care community. Mm -hmm. Do you know if having a long-term care insurance policy would help with the pricing? And if you can't answer right. that, I, I... Well, I think we can both. I'll, I'll get your answer first, and I'll chime in from the legal side. How's sure, that? Sure, that's great. Okay. You know, many communities do offer uh, discounts in entrance fees and or monthly fees. So it depends on the community, um, but that's certainly a conversation to have mm -hmm. with the sales advisor that you're working with at that community. Yeah, and then to add to that, what I've seen, many clients come to us and they say, Julian, could you review my CCRC contract before I sign it? Um, because I, it's, a, it's a legal document. I wanna understand how it works. I'd like to know how my kids or my spouse gets the money, if it's a refundable deposit or something, you know, when, when I die, where's that money go? Um, interestingly, um, many of the CCRCs will pay the refundable deposit to the probate estate or to a trust. And so they won't typically pay that that refundable deposit to directly to uh, the children. And so that's another reason why we have a lot of clients who will go into CCRCs and then they realize they really need a trust because the trust can be the payee of the refundable deposit, which can sometimes be several hundred thousand dollars. And if you're just talking about getting a refundable deposit, there is really no you know, no issue there. Why would you want to go through probate just to get your refund? Um, so we really try to avoid probate as much as possible. And those refundable CCRC deposits are typically the catalyst to get people in there. So um, probably more than you wanted to know about that. <laughs> but, Thank you. Okay. And I believe this is now our final question. Okay. Am I understanding that a family trust can essentially replace a will or do I need both? 
Yeah, once again, you can use any type of a trust um, for various reasons. And and like I said, if you do it correctly, so if you set up a trust and then you change the title of your assets into the trust, like your home and your checking account and your investments, um, you will not need a will when you die because a will only acts upon assets that are in your sole name at death. It's the only time a will is needed. And so if you die with property in joint names or in a trust, or with a beneficiary designation like an IRA, you don't need your will to go get that that asset. So um, yes, many of our clients that we do trusts for never use their wills when they die. Julian, thank you so much for the discussion today. I'd also like to thank the attendees who submitted such great questions for you to discuss. If you'd like to download a copy of today's slide presentation, click the handout drop down in the webinar dialog box. Are you interested in learning more about how Envisage can help you prepare for the future? Visit Envisage.org to learn more or call us at 866-599-0925 to continue the conversation with us. Have a great day.